So let's dive in and where we're going to be talking about, we kind of touched on a lot this week in various little pieces. So one of the first things I want to do this morning is put a lot of those pieces together about the story of African Americans in Texas. Um, and to do that, we got to go back to one of our big themes, which is making connections across units in Texas history, right? We did this when we talked about the story of Tejanos, which you really can't understand Tejanos and the Texas Revolution, unless you really go back to the Spanish and Mexican national periods and, and see the evolution for them of their experience in the region. Uh, the same is true with African Americans. You have to take a, a kind of bigger, longer lens. And you know it's really important to, I think, touch on certain issues during especially the 1820, about the 1820s in the Mexican national period, if you're gonna be able to have your students understand the place and the position of African-Americans and slavery at the time of the Texas revolution, right? So I wanna dive in and kind of lay some stuff out there. We're gonna to, we're gonna to touch on some things. We've touched on a few other places, especially when we talked about Tejanos. The idea here is to kind of stitch all this together, all right? So the place to begin, all right, which is also good because it can spiral up to eighth grade US history. If you wanna understand the place of African-Americans in Texas during this period, you have to understand the context of the cotton revolution that we touched upon on Tuesday a little bit, but I wanna lay out in some more detail, all right? And the place to begin with the cotton revolution, which really explodes in the 18 teens, all right? When we think of cotton becoming a big force in not just North America, but really the broad Atlantic world. It starts in the 18 teens. And the reason for that is because of the English, all right? So really we have to pull the camera back a good long ways here and, and start our story in, in London, England, which I know kind of sounds a little weird. But what I always tell my students is that if you lived in the 19th century, you lived in a British world. The the, the British Empire was, in the 19th century, everything that the United States has been since World War II, which is to say the world's uh, largest economy, most powerful economic force, most powerful political um, system in the entire world. Um, they were the dominant power in the Atlantic. And the reason they were so powerful and so dominant is because they had a massive trade empire. They had a very big, very powerful Navy that went all over the world buying and selling things, mostly selling stuff. And the epicenter of what they were selling around the world were da -da -da, textiles. I know all of our students just can't wait to hear about textile. But textiles are fascinating because this is the epicenter of the industrial revolution. So you guys see this image right here. This is an early factory, an industrial factory where they've got these big machines doing what used to be done by hand, which is making cloth of various sorts. And what they would do is they would feed into these machines wool, and the machines would then process that wool into fabric that could be turned into men's suits, women's dresses, you know, uh, tablecloths, um, sheets, all kinds, I mean, basically anything you could possibly need in terms of textiles. And that was incredibly popular around the whole world. And the British sold it all over the place and made enormous amounts of money. The problem was, well, one, wool can be very hot in the summer, as we here in Texas are all too well aware. Um, but the other problem was, it was so successful that they couldn't really scale it up very easily. There's only so many Scottish sheep that you can shear in order to feed wool into these machines. So what they needed, the British, what they needed was a source of fibers that they could feed in these machines that could, they could get a large quantity of and scale up. And they started experimenting in the late 1700s, early 1800s, with cotton as a fiber that might, might be able to fit that bill, right? And cotton turned out to have a ton of advantages. It was really light and durable. You could print things on it. Um, so the British loved it. But the best part about it is that you could get people to grow it and you could expand the, the supply of raw cotton. And so you could never run out in producing these textiles for the British Empire, right? So at the conclusion of the War of 1812, the British put out a call for cotton. They say they pay, you know, top dollar or top pound, I guess, um, for as much cotton as you could possibly provide. And so that produced um, one of the most important and powerful migrations in American history. And we talked about this a little bit when we talked about Jose Antonio Navarro, because 
Navarro ends up in Louisiana at pretty much the same time cotton economy explodes in places like Louisiana and Mississippi and Alabama, right? And that's this map here. People are pouring down in the 18 teens into the Mississippi River Valley. And the reason they're doing it is because the British put out that call for um, cotton. The price doubled overnight in 1815 of cotton from 15 cents a pound to 30 cents a pound. And the result was this massive movement of people because everyone's pushing their way down into the, the, this area to grow cotton, right? And I think, as I said, that's on Tuesday, but this is the goal. People are building uh, farms and plantations in Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana. They're growing massive amounts of cotton because if you can grow it and you can pick it and you can clean that cotton, thanks to the cotton gin, you can bail it up in these 450 pound blocks and then you can put it on one of these ships. So you see the steamship out here in the background. This is a uh, brand new technology uh, by the 18 teens coming up and down the Mississippi. Um, then uh, people would ship that cotton down in New Orleans, put it in boats bound for, um, for New York and um, Liverpool, England. And then you could make an enormous amount of money sending cotton out that way, right? Now, people um, who are coming down to the Mississippi River Valley, some are coming voluntarily, but a large percentage, 40% of the people who are coming down are not coming down voluntarily. They are enslaved men, women, and children who are coming down as the labor force for these cotton plantations, right? When you think of a Mississippi cotton plantation, right, you probably think of enslaved labor, and there's a good reason for that. Um, there are huge numbers of enslaved people being brought down, men, women, and children. And the reason is very, very basic economics, but the, the, the calculus was very clear. Every enslaved person that you could put to work on your plantation meant eight to 10 more acres that you could plant and pick in cotton, all right? Every enslaved person could do up to eight to 10 acres in full, full production. That means eight to 10 more bales of cotton that you can sell. And the math turned into something very, very simple. You bought an enslaved person. That person would pay for themselves in the first year, and then you'd make a profit on top of that. And then after that, you own that person, and those acres are going to produce cotton every single year. So you can make an enormous amount of money. So slavery spread into the Mississippi River Valley in massive numbers um, during the 18 teens. Um, by 1820, there is um, every third person in Alabama is enslaved, um, half half of all Louisianans were enslaved by 1820, all right? As we talked about, um, when we talked about Navarro on Tuesday, that produced this massive migration up to the Texas border, right? You got 150,000 people in Louisiana, 75,000 in Mississippi, 144,000 um, in Alabama. The total, if you add all these up, is, you know, 370,000 people that are piling up along the border, right? This is what Stephen F. Austin is bringing into Texas, right? This is the extension of Mississippi is what he's bringing in to Mexico. And this is his father's idea. This is his plan is that these cotton farmers want and need cheap land and Mexico has lots of it. In fact, if you show up in Austin's colony, you're gonna get seven square miles of land for showing up. That's an enormous amount of territory. You could never get that much land in Mississippi. Land started going, good land in Mississippi started going for $50 an acre by the 1820s. So you can imagine what Austin's trying to set up in Texas is the stampede of cotton farmers who are coming over, right? To set up these farms, right? And this is that sketch I've shown you guys before of what a Texas farm looked like, right? This is, you know, the, the big house being this log cabin right here, but all these cabins in the background, these are the cabins of enslaved people who are being brought into Texas as a part of that cotton economy. If you're bringing the cotton economy, you're also bringing the labor system that makes that profitable. And Austin was very clear about that from the very beginning. It was in his father's original proposal to Spain. And then Austin's, you know, he tells the Tejados and he's very clear about why this is key. He's saying, if we're gonna compete with Mississippi, we've gotta have the labor system that made it profitable in Mississippi. And as we said, we talked about Navarro on Tuesday. So again, we're, we're tying things together that we've, we've touched on at different points throughout the week. But 
From the Tejano perspective, we talked about Navarro, right? The Tejanos have seen nothing but devastation up until this point. But they have also seen how much cotton and therefore slavery has brought prosperity and wealth to places like Louisiana. And Navarro here, again, he saw that firsthand when he was in Louisiana from 1813 to 1816. He's there when this thing explodes. He recognizes that. And so for the Tejanos, they're very happy to bring the cotton economy in. And if that means bringing in slavery as well, then the Tejanos like Navarro here are going to support that as a means to a greater end, which is the development of the region. And that's what produces the Anglo-Tejano alliance that brings in American settlers, it brings in the cotton economy, and therefore it brings in enslaved African-Americans into Texas, right? That's, that's, the, that's the, the way that, that the enslaved African-Americans are being brought in as a part of this whole system. And so where they're going, when you think of people African-Americans in Texas during this time period, you really need to think of Austin's colony here, right? Which straddled the, the Brazos and the Colorado rivers because this is where all of the farms are being established under Austin's watch. And so that's where enslaved people are being brought to work on those plantations. Um, these plantations all fronted the rivers. So when you guys think of these places, you should think of, you know, everybody got a little bit of riverfront property and then kind of a rectangle that would extend backward from there that was carved out on the river. Everybody got to kind of pick their spot on the river as long as somebody else hadn't claimed it. But you want to imagine, you know, along this river is a line of farms, both the Colorado and the Brazos, and enslaved people um, working on not all or even most of these farms, but a significant number of them living in these territories right here. And so for the lives of African-Americans in Texas, the vast majority are enslaved. Um, there are a handful of free African-Americans in Texas, and we'll talk about one person later on um, that's, that will give us a good story about that. Um, but almost all are enslaved people. There's more men than women because men were more valuable to most of these planters as field hands. And, you know, slavery in Texas under Austin's colony operated the same way that slavery went on in Mississippi or Alabama. Um, you, you, it was built around cotton. It was built around the, um, the, the seasonality of cotton, you know, planting in the March um, period, um, tending over the summer, picking it in the, picking it in the fall. And for the enslaved, that was, that was the, the, the breadth of their world was working in these cotton fields, oftentimes alongside their uh, masters. And everything that was true about the violence of slavery in the United States was true in Texas. The, the whipping, the threat of violence, um, the threat constantly that you or your loved ones could be sold away from one another. Um, you know, I teach I teach a class on the rise and fall of slavery in the United States um, every year at UNT. And one of the things my students often have a hard time doing is defining slavery. Like they know it when they see it, but how would you put, make a definition of that? And one of the things that we often come back to in that class is that, you know, it's a system that is exploiting these people for economic gain, but the real power of that is that they're humans that are being treated as objects and property, right? And the dehumanization of that is really hard to articulate, um, but it's constant and it's very real. And I think the most um, concentrated way to think about that is that what slavery means is that they can sell your children from you at any time because it is in their interest and economic interest to do so. And that happened to enormous numbers of enslaved. Um, didn't happen to everybody, but the threat was always there. The reality that at any moment, this, you could be separated from the people who mean the most to you. And I think as humans, we're most defined by our connections to other human beings. And so the precarious realities, not only that you could be eaten at any moment, not only that you could be sold, but that you could be separated from those who help define who you are as a person because of your relationships to your wife or your husband or your son or your daughter or your mother or your father. Right? That is the, the base reality of what slavery really meant. And slavery was uh, a big part of Austin's colony, which Austin said time and again. Um, as early as 1825, they did a, a census of Austin's colony for the first time in 1825, and fully 25% of everybody who was in Austin's colony was an enslaved person. Um, it was at the very center of the economy going forward because 
So because cotton was. Um, one of the best examples of the kinds of folks who are bringing enslaved people in is Jared Gross, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Jared Gross was, uh, he was born in Virginia. He spent some time in South Carolina. He's a Southerner. And he had gone to Alabama in the 18 teens during the Cotton Revolution. So he's there in Alabama when all of that's blowing up. He's getting land, he's growing cotton, he's acquiring slaves, he's doing very well. Uh, until the Panic of 1819 devastates a lot of the American economy. And in the aftermath of that, Jared Gross sees Austin's advertisements about Texas. About, hey, you can get seven square miles of land for showing up. In fact, if you bring your family, you get more land. And if you bring enslaved people with you, you get even more land. You get 50 acres extra for every enslaved person that you bring with you. And the reason Austin did that is because he was putting a premium on people who had wealth and could invest in Texas, which would be predominantly cotton farmers with slaves. And so he made an incentive for those who really had a lot to, to bring it with them. Um, and Jared Gross here took advantage of that. He came in 1822 to Austin's colony, set up his plantation on the Brazos River, which he called Bernardo. And he brought 90, at least 90 enslaved people with him when he came in from the United States. He's the largest slaveholder in, in Texas. And nobody else had as much wealth as he did, but virtually everybody else in Austin's colony came from the same place that Jared Gross did, the American South. 90% uh, of all the colonists who were in Austin's colony had come from the American South, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, Tennessee, all the way up to Virginia. That's where they were coming from, all right? Now, this turned into a bit of a challenge within Texas because Mexico as a nation was not universally in favor of allowing slavery to stay legal in Mexico, much less, you know, Texas. And we talked about this again when we talked uh, about Jose Antonio Navarro and the Tejano perspective on developing all of these regions and everything like that. But as I remind you, most Mexicans um, across most of Mexico wanted to outlaw slavery for a variety of reasons. Um, the only place that people were saying, no, we must keep slavery legal in Mexico was from Texas, right? And this came out during the debates over the Constitution of 1824. We talked to day one about the debates of the Constitution of 1824, right? and how important that constitution is. I think it's a theme that's come out from this entire week is that the constitution of 1824 was a central pivot point in this entire um, period. And one of the things they were debating when they wrote that constitution was, is slavery gonna be legal in Mexico? Most Mexicans wanted to outlaw it. But from Texas, you hear a different story. So here's Stephen F. Austin telling everybody in Mexico City, he's saying, he said this a lot of ways in his letters. There's a lot of documents you could use. But this is probably his most succinct way of saying it, where he said, the primary product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton. And we cannot do this without the help, help being quite a euphemism, I'd say, the help of slaves, right? And the Tejanos um, understood this, right? Here, here's Erasmus again saying, tell Austin, he was writing to Baron de Bastrop, tell Austin that I'm well aware that the abolition of the slaves will hinder immigration, right? That's Erasmus who helped write the Constitution of 1824, his son Juan Seguin, we spent a lot of time with on Tuesday as well. And so the Tejanos and Anglos are united in trying to keep slavery legal. So when the Constitution of 1824 is written, it, uh, it doesn't decide the issue of slavery. In fact, it doesn't say anything about slavery. But that was on purpose. And you guys will remember, because this is a federal document, right? everything that's named in this document is something that the national government would deal with. Everything that wasn't named, which included slavery, was an issue for the individual states to decide, which meant whatever state Texas was a part of would get to decide the slavery issue for itself, which excited folks in Texas um, because they, that's why they love federalism. They wanted the power to control the development of their own region. And so they felt that this was gonna give them a real opportunity to do that on the issue of slavery amongst many others. The problem, became that the state of Coahuila that Texas was attached to, to make the new state of Coahuila, Texas, most Coahuilans also wanted to outlaw slavery. And so the Texans started fighting once more, this time in the state capital in Saltillo, over whether slavery would remain legal in, in Texas. And the Coahuilans tried to outlaw slavery 
And in the Constitution of 1827, which is the state constitution, we have Texas. And this is a, a, a the page, the first page of that constitution. I just like to point this out. This is published bilingually. It was published in Spanish and in English. And it's the only constitution in all of Mexico that was published in two languages. Um, I always just think that's a really neat thing. The constitution laid out a whole bunch of stuff of how Coahuila, Texas would be run. But the main issue that most Texans were concerned about was what the question, what was going to be done about the issue of slavery, as most Coahuilans wanted to outlaw it, right? And what the Coahuilans did is they wrote something called Article 13 into the Constitution, which I'm, I'm giving you the full text right here so you can see it and use it. I work, I use this with my students. It's real short, but we break it apart together and it's really helpful. Let me explain what it's really saying. All right, so some take a couple notes here. This is what Article 13 said. Article 13 basically said, um, we're gonna end slavery, but we're gonna do it really slowly. And the way it's gonna work is that any slaves currently in Texas, like on Jared Gross's plantation, will be slaves for the rest of their lives, All right? In fact, and you'll see this right here, there's, six, there's a six month provision here. The Quilans said, we'll give you six more months to bring in more slaves. You can go to New Orleans, you can load up, you can bring them in. All those people will be slaves for the rest of their lives. The only people who are going to be freed are the children of these slaves, All right? So slavery is gonna take uh, a generation to be outlawed. That's what the Kuilans think. And they think this is a nice kind of compromise measure that will make things easy in Texas to transition over the long haul away from slavery, right? The problem here is that while the Kuilans are trying to do away with slavery this way, the Anglos and Tejanos in Texas do not, not see this as a, a calm compromise way to deal with slavery. They see this as an immediate threat. And we talked about this um, when we talked about Jose Antonio Navarro. So I'll, I'll just do the quick version of this. But Austin saw this as an imminent threat to his colony because it meant in six more months, nobody's going to be able to migrate with their slaves from the American South. So nobody's going to come from Mississippi or Alabama into Texas anymore if slavery is outlawed. And so he doesn't think this, this means we have a generation to solve this issue. He feels like We've got six months, and after six months, no more Americans are going to leave the American South to come to Texas if they have to leave behind the labor system that makes their cotton fields so profitable. So Austin comes up with an idea to call slavery, not slavery, but indentured servitude or contract labor, really. And so he sends a proposal to Jose Antonio Navarro to get a law passed in Saltillo that says contracts sign in the United States states are legal in Mexico. And the reason, of course, is that what they're going to do is have slaveholders who are coming into Austin's colony stop in Louisiana, free their slaves, and then in exchange for their freedom, those slaves will sign 99-year service contracts to learn, quote, the mysteries of agriculture or the mysteries of domestic service. These English common law examples as, as their text and all this stuff. It's just a way to get slavery to stay legal by calling it contract labor, right? Navarro takes that to the state legislature. He manages to get it passed as something called Decree 56, which here, this is that, this is the full version of Decree 56. Um, and what it does is it just basically says you can have contracts that are signed in the United States, legal in Mexico, and it's gonna be used to keep slavery alive by just calling it contracted labor, which is a farce. It's a legal loophole. And it really gives us a sense of, of just how much Austin and the Tejanos believed that if they're gonna have cotton survive in Texas, they need to keep slavery alive as the means for making that happen, right? So um, Austin gets this published in the New Orleans newspapers um, where it explains in the New Orleans newspapers, it says, here's how, to evade, here's how you evade the laws in Mexico against slavery, do the following, fill in this contract just this way, and news spread in the United States, and it worked. Uh, American slaveholders continue to come into Mexico with this legal loophole. This combined with other things that to make Mexico City nervous about what was going on in Texas, right? Um, reports of what was going on started coming from the Mexican consul in New Orleans, who was writing down to Mexico and they're evading our laws and they're, they're making a mockery of Mexican authority in the region. 
And so when we talk about the rise of centralism in Mexico City and the efforts of Mexico City to start clamping down on Texas, this is a big reason for that. And so this helps lead to the law of April 6th, 1830, right? Of course, outrages Anglos and Tejanos in Texas and leads to increased strife between Anglos and, and Tejanos with Mexico City. This leads up ultimately to when Santa Ana overthrows the Constitution of 1824. And when he does that, Santa Ana overthrows the Constitution. It upsets Texans tremendously because they believed in the Constitution because it promised individual states the rights to decide issues for themselves, right? In Texas, that meant a lot of things. But one of the things that it meant was the issue of slavery. You know, getting separate statehood for the Anglos and Tejanos was a big deal for a lot of reasons. One of which, not the only reason, but one of which was to protect slavery. So when the Constitution gets overthrown in 1824, um, this is sparking the Texas Revolution as the civil war between Federalists and Centralists break out, and slavery's right in the middle of all of that. I want to emphasize an interpretive point here. All right? I want to say this very clearly. The revolution was sparked because of the overthrow of the Constitution of 1824. All right? And it's a civil war in Mexico between Federalists and Centralists. That's what starts the Texas Revolution. It, the Texas Revolution is not started because there's an immediate threat to slavery. But the reason, one of the reasons that Tejanos and Anglos are so strongly Federalist on that side of the Civil War is because they want to protect slavery. So slavery is woven into this, if that makes sense. It's not the primary cause of the Texas Revolution, but it is a fundamental part of why Anglos and Tejanos are strong Federalists and want to oppose Santa Ana and want to restore the Constitution of 1824. We've talked about this many times thus. Right? So when the revolution breaks out, it encompasses um, African Americans in Texas in big and powerful ways. Um, and a lot of this comes back to the fact that there's now a war in Texas, and the the, the African Americans who are enslaved in Austin's colonies are kind of in the middle of that. Um, when 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 Jose, or oh, sorry, when um, when Santa Ana marches into Texas, he writes a letter down to Mexico City where he he references the fact that a lot of slaves have been brought into Texas illegally with this contract thing from Decree Fifty Six. Right, this is a letter from Santa Ana to his Minister of War, Jose Maria Tornel, um, where he says, "This is Santa Ana talking." There is a considerable number of slaves in Texas also who have been introduced by their masters under cover of certain questionable contracts. That's that Decree 56 stuff he's talking about. But who, according to our laws, should be free? Shall we permit those wretches to moan in chains any longer in a country whose laws protect the liberty of man without distinction of caste or color, right? My point in this is that what he's asking for is permission to free slaves of Austin's colony. That is not Santa Ana's main intention when he marches into Texas. He's not marching in to free the slaves. He's marching in to put down the rebellion. But along the way, if you put if you free some slaves, that might be a good way to chase the Anglos out of Texas. Is one of the things that Santa Ana is thinking. Of, all right, but Santa is aware of the slavery situation in Texas, and the enslaved themselves are well aware that tensions are higher during the revolution itself. Um, there's a big fear. There's always a fear among slaveholders that their slaves will rebel. And when the revolution begins, there's a, a bigger fear that the enslaved will become um, encouraged to rebel against slavery and their masters um, as a result of the Texas Revolution. So at the beginning of the revolution, there's about 100 enslaved people along the Brazos River who were suspected of planning a slave rebellion. They probably weren't. We have no evidence that they were doing this, but they were suspected of it. And so about 100 of them were rounded up and either, you can see the quote, nearly whipped to death or hung, because a lot of the Texas planters and farmers are feeling very vulnerable that not only is the Mexican army marching in, but maybe this will inspire their slaves to rebel against them. So they might have enemies both within and marching in from Mexico. And the enslaved also during the revolution took the opportunity to try to run away to freedom whenever they could. This will also happen during the American Civil War when the Union, Union armies march near uh, Confederate plantations, enslaved people, ran away whenever they could. So when uh, Urea's army approaches Victoria, you can see here in April of 1836, at least 14 enslaved people ran away to his lines for protection, right? And during the runaway scrape, there are hundreds, if not thousands of enslaved people 
who are being driven as a part of the runaway scrape toward Louisiana are being driven by their masters to keep them away from the Mexican armies. And so you guys remember the Lou Rose's account of the river crossings. She said that there were more African-Americans than white people at a lot of the river crossings because there were so many masters trying to herd their slaves westward. Um, James Perry, who was Stephen F. Austin's brother-in-law, herded all of his slaves towards Louisiana to try to keep them away from the Mexican army and the possibility of them being freed and, and taken away from him, right? So the revolution was fundamentally involved with uh, all the situations that enslaved people found themselves in within Texas. And so we're gonna talk next um, about one of the most famous enslaved people in Texas during the revolution, Joe, who was a slave of William Barrett Travis. Um, but for now I'm gonna stop um, and pause here so I can hand it over to my colleague, Dave Ferguson, who's gonna walk you guys through some resources that will be helpful for some of this stuff. All right. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. It is Thursday, as we all know. Um, I have a split screen, so I'm going to work off of this screen over on, on to my left, but I'm not, it's not that I don't want to face you straight on. Um, one of the things I want, Michelle and I, and for uh, some of it as well as too, as Dr. Target, we've, the responses that you guys have given are, have been really, really good. Um, but we also, to me, I kind of take a step back and I just want to kind of set the stage for what I'm doing today. Michelle knocked it out of the park yesterday. I, I think you all could see how excited she was to um, spend on this topic. Um, she did a really, really good job. Um, my version of what I'm going to be presenting today on African Americans in the Texas Revolution, um, I've got a little bit of an expansion of slavery, a, the story of Joe, and then we have Emily West. And what I want to do, I've, and I'm kind of hearing what you're saying, because I've been to PD trainings before where I get a, if I'm fortunate to get information, a lot of times I'm kind of going, how am I going to make this work? How am I going to get it into my district scope and sequence? You know, for this particular unit, I have uh, 15 days. Um, some districts are making us as Texas history teachers tie to the specific um, scope and sequence how we're going to do this. We have X number of days. We start here, we end here, then we move on. So that's kind of where I'm going to be talking today. I'm going to go over the resources as we go over them, but I'm going to tell you specifically how I would use them because some of the resources I would not, I could not get all of this stuff in this unit. I know that for a fact. So today um, we have three pieces we're going to be talking about. Um, and my version of working with the documents is similar to, uh oh, that should not be there. Apologize for that. Um, please make a copy of these if you could on your end of it. This should be set up for just copy piece. Um, this background essay is kind of pretty much what Dr. Torget was just talking about. Um, the one thing I do want to point out in here, Michelle and I were kind of, we wanted to make certain that we understood. Um, and we're bringing in various aspects of the teaks. Um, and again, you can modify this, but the profitability of it is removing the cotton seed, um, as we all know, and that's through the cotton gin and, and that's in our teaks. So, um, and I have the cotton gin right up here on, on top of that. So that kind of gives us the ability to add more um, depth to it. Kids could see this. You could actually insert an image of the cotton gin here if you wanted to do that as well too. Um, but again, you can make use for with this doc background essay as much as you want to. Um, within this, um, I, what I tried to show is the perspective in Texas of really cotton followed by um, slavery. And then this first document is Stephen F. Austin um, basically talking about um, the primary product that will elevate us from poverty is cotton. We cannot do this without the help of the slaves. Um, and the thought process on this particular one, I would use this really as um, I could keep it in this unit. I could actually go to, um, you know, the impresarios and use that as a warm up, um, putting these two questions up front or one of the questions as a warm up coming into the classroom when we're fixing to talk about impresarios um, or when we're talking about Stephen F. Austin. Um, I would not just leave it as this document here. I would probably, um, what I call, um, recycle it into a, another activity for myself, um, for my students. So I do like the content, but to me, this, this um, hook will 
five minutes, we respond, have them respond as a group, and then um, or turn and talk, and then we talk about it in the classroom, and just really kind of figuring out what he means by that. Um, I also made a point that he spends considerable time trying to convince the Tejanos of this plan, economic prosperity. But then as we scroll down, um, we're going to see the, the struggle that he and most of the folks in Texas face. Um, he's gonna turn to his old friend, uh, Resmo Seguin, uh, where he writes a letter. Um, this letter is coming past the decree uh, 412 um, in 1824. Um, the, it declared all slaves free virtually by setting foot in Mexican soil, which, as we know, panicked all the Anglo settlers. Um, so here we have primary source from Stephen F. Austin talking about going to Esmer, uh, uh, Resmo Seguin about that particular um, issue and the, the hysteria that it is causing. Um, I like where he says we will consider all of the acts bad faith by the government. Um, that could also be flipped into, do you think this right here to your students is going to generate um, outright rebellion in this period? So um, again, this, these, I would probably in, in my classroom, I would, I have this quote, I have it in my PowerPoint presentation. And it's kind of one of those little stopping points, as I mentioned last time, that I will stop at a certain point, ask a question, we turn and talk, um, and or we do some type of activity for three to five minutes um, to get the kids maybe up and around. I have a lot group, groups talking to one other group where they're talking, trying to prove their answer to the other group, um, which it gives the kids a little ability to uh, move around the classroom. Now that does generate settling down piece of it too. I wouldn't do this at the very beginning of the school year, but depending on your class and the time of year, you could definitely do that piece of it. Um, and then the last one, last um, document, is um, this is a um, side of Austin. I've discovered this and this really, really is a good example of what Austin is talking about. Um, Randolph B. Campbell um, basically does an analysis of Austin and I like this. He backed, slavery, backed away from slavery when it was threatening his colonization project um, but he did more than any individual to establish slavery in Mexican Texas. But I also like the quote that um, the incentives and land distribution, as Dr. Torg was talking about, favored those individuals who had slaves. Um, I bring in that what he was just talking about the conclusion uh, before we broke away, segue to me, is bringing in these, these individuals who have that um, institute or that system in place and offering them more land. I found it fascinating when I was doing my research that um, I, the way I've always taught this um, piece with Austin, he would literally say, all right, you're going to get a league of this and then you get a little bit for this and this and this. Um, but I discovered that he, that was not always the case. It was a little bit different depending upon who the individual was, like Jared Gross. I'm sure Jared Gross got a sweet heart of a deal on land based upon um, what he was bringing into um, Texas. So this kind of shows the different side of Austin. Um, it gives him, I don't know, I mean, I, I would say more um, realist. I, I mean, I know we call him the father of Texas, but at the same time, I just feel like that is a whitewashed approach to who he really is. I do think that he's human and he does have errors. I do believe that his impresario contract was his main motivation to do anything. So if it meant additional slavery um, into Texas, he was going to fight to ensure that it, it definitely does. So that is all I have to share with you. Again, this is just background stuff. I would, again, not use it in its entirety. I, I'm not suggesting that at all. What I am suggesting is, is, can you find pieces of this that you can include with what you're already teaching? Um, I've already given you a couple examples that I already do some of this stuff. I included in my PowerPoint when my kids are taking notes. Um, we do the activities with it. We do a quick turn and talk. Um, that's the intent. Is this probably more information that you probably would use? Yeah, I get it. But as a, you're here to learn a little bit more. Um, and Dr. Torg is doing a, the stories he's telling, he's a storyteller. Um, that's the reason why I've always enjoyed working with him. So again, if you have any questions on where I would use it, um, and at the conclusion of 
of this doc, not this document, but my section or portion of this, I'll tell you exactly what the one thing that um, I have incorporated that the kids truly, truly love. So again, I'm trying to find ways for you guys to use this realistically. Um, and if you have any thoughts or comments, definitely reach out and let me know. All right, Dr. Turret. Thank you, Jay. Thank you so much. Yeah, the nice thing is about um, one thing, so one of our strategies, I think, here is to give you guys as much as we can so that you can adapt the pieces that fit the best for you. And I think there's a lot of different ways to bring these stories in. And in different classrooms, every time we teach a class, at least every time I teach a class, every classroom is different too. So I'm always recalibrating um, depending on who my students are in a given year. Um, one story that helped a lot, again, we go back to biographies, that's another theme this week, is how we tell these stories through personal personal narratives. And it helps, I think, students understand you know, these very big ideas as lived through a particular person. And so the story of Joe, I think, is a really, a really powerful one. Um, and the story of Joe is a, is a little bit like the story of Susanna Dickinson, who we always talk about in terms of the Alamo. And there's great reasons for that. And that is one of the best hooks to bring in Joe or Susanna. But for both of them, their lives are much bigger than that. And as we saw with Susanna, she experienced the full breadth of the revolution and all its devastation. And Joe also had a much bigger, broader life that gives us, I think, a, a bigger window into Texas during this very tumultuous time period. So I want to tell you guys uh, a, a version, or as fast as a version as I can give you guys, of Joe's story, um, as best we know it. I saw in the chat uh, some people referring to a book that was written just a couple years ago about Joe, which we'll, we'll give you guys some resources on that um, on Friday. But um, Joe, we know some things about Joe and some things we just don't, because the lives of the enslaved typically aren't very well documented. Uh, we have more on Joe than we have on a lot of people who are living in Texas at this time. But our basic um, ideas and understanding of Joe is he was born around 1815, all right? He was born most likely in Kentucky. And, you know, he was raised in the world of slavery right at the time of the Cotton Revolution. So when I talked about the Cotton Revolution blowing up in 1815, that's when Joe was born. So he grows into this world, um, much as our students today have only known the world after 9-11 changed so much. Um, he's only known the world that the cotton has made. And so he grows up um, in this world. He's, he moves to St. Louis at a certain point, and then he's brought down to Louisiana. And he's bought and sold several times. Um, he's separated from family members. So everything I talked about earlier, he, Joe experiences that firsthand. And he's bought eventually by a guy named Isaac Mansfield, who decides to come into Texas in 1832. So how does Joe come into Texas? Joe comes into Texas um, with one of those indentured servitude contracts that Decree 56 made possible. So Joe is essentially smuggled into Texas under the ruse of contract labor. And he's brought into Texas, but he's treated as he was in Kentucky um, or Missouri, he's treated as an enslaved person. And so despite the contract, which says, you're just gonna work for me, Isaac Mansfield for 10 years, he is bought and sold. Isaac Mansfield doesn't do very well financially, so he ends up trying to sell Joe. Joe finds out about that um, in 1833 and 34, and he runs away. And so Mansfield gets the county sheriff to go get him. And the county sheriff then charges Mansfield money for recovering his runaway slave, and then Mansfield dies in debt. So Joe is then sold at public auction to cover the bill for recovering him from running away. And what we do know about Joe from this period is that, you know, his life is in this very tumultuous um, experience of being bought and sold multiple times. And he's trying to run away to get away from a lot of this as much and as best as he can. And eventually he is sold in early 1835 to William Barrett Travis, who Travis you guys know was, you know, he was a, a lawyer in San Felipe. He'd come from Alabama, Travis had, and was very familiar with slavery and had actually rented um, Joe as a body servant for a while. And then he buys him outright in, in early 1835. 
And so Joe's not going to work on a cotton plantation. Joe is working as a as the body servant of William Barrett Travis. And so he travels with Travis wherever Travis is going. And you guys remember, we talked day one about divisions in Texas during the revolution. William Barrett Travis is one of the leaders of the war party. He's really angling for a fight with Mexico. And so Travis is with him at the outbreak. I'm sorry, Joe is with Travis at the outbreak of the Texas Revolution. Here we've got, of course, um, we keep coming back to when Gonzalez happened. And so when Travis travels to San Antonio to take command of the quote unquote regular forces um, in San Antonio that will ultimately go into the Alamo, you know, Joe's with him. Joe sees all of this. Joe's in San Antonio in these, you know, um, early 1836 period. And everything's kind of discombobulated and no one's quite sure what's going to happen. And so Joe goes into the Alamo with Travis when Santa Ana marches into San Antonio on February 23rd, 1836. And when they go into the Alamo, you know, Joe is following Travis, doing Travis's bidding, whatever that might end up being. He's, he's being an enslaved person and he's not the only slave in the Alamo. Um, we said with Susanna Dickinson um, and the Hispanic women, there was, there was many non-combatants, upwards of a, you know, a dozen or so in the Alamo. There was at least two other enslaved people in the Alamo, a man and a woman. But Joe didn't have much time or contact with them. He's spending his time with Travis, who's sort of at the center of, of everything that's happening in the Alamo. And so you guys can see here on this sketch right here, number 19. This is where Travis's headquarters were, supposedly. This is where... Travis and Joe spent a lot of time during the siege. And so all the bombardment of the Alamo for 13 days, the terror of that experience, the exploding ordnance that's being lobbed into the, the fort, um, the wondering if you're gonna get reinforced or you're gonna get slaughtered, if we're gonna run out of food, everything that went on in the Alamo siege, Joe experienced just like everybody else. And the difference is he has less say over what happens to him and what opportunities he has. And so he's there on the morning of March 6th in the pre-dawn darkness when Santa's troops attack the Alamo. And when Santa's troops, you know, come running up uh, against the walls there and the cannons start firing off and the muskets start going off and chaos erupts inside the Alamo itself, you know, Travis, who had been sleeping at that moment, Joe and Travis were sleeping at the moment that the battle began. Um, Travis jumps up, grabs his shotgun, his double barrel shotgun, yells to Joe to wake up and grab a rifle and follow him. Now, Joe has no choice here, right? This is not because Joe is wanting to do this. Joe is doing this because he's property and he has to follow what his master says. So when Travis comes running out of this, this building right here, he makes his way over to the north wall. Joe's right behind him. And then Travis gets up here on the north wall, leans over the wall and fires off both barrels of a shotgun and immediately is shot in the head and falls down backwards. And we know a lot about this moment because Travis's um, enslaved servant, Joe, will write it, well, not write about it, but he'll testify about it later that other people will write down. And so it's from Joe that we know that he was shot in the head, he falls down, and he's basically incapacitated at that moment. And then Joe has a choice. He could keep fighting at the wall there, shooting over the walls, or he could go back to the, the headquarters he'd been in and barricade himself. That's what Joe does. He goes and barricades himself. Heads back down this way, goes and barricades himself in this room, and he hears the entire battle, much like Susanna Dickinson did, Juan Navarro did, all those sounds and horrificness of the killing and slaughtering of all these people is going on right outside his door, and he has to be wondering the entire time if he is going to be killed, because everybody's being killed, especially every male in the, in the building is being killed. He says he sticks his rifle out of the window a couple of times and takes some shots at the Mexican soldiers in the courtyard. But basically, he barricades himself throughout most of the fight. At the end of the slaughtering, all right, uh, there's a lull then that follows. And out of that lull, there's a Mexican officer who yells out in the middle of this courtyard, are there any Negroes here? And it's at that point that Joe pushes his head out the door real fast and says, yes, here's one, and yells out, I'm here. And immediately, as soon as he does that, a Mexican soldier who's very jittery because he's just been fighting to the death, everybody around him, tries to kill Joe and fires his musket at him. And that musket ball grazes one of Joe's sides and does a small injury there. And then another Mexican soldier who's near Joe lunges at him with a bayonet to stab him to death. And that, Joe 
tries to push out of the way and that bayonet hits his other side. So immediately he's wounded, he's shot and stabbed at the very moment he's trying to surrender. And a Mexican, fortunately for Joe, a Mexican officer there with his sword just starts smacking all of his men and pushing them back and, and gets between them and Joe to keep them from killing him. And so Joe's captured and he is then, I'd say asked, but he's, it's not really a choice. He's told to identify the bodies of uh, the leaders, Travis, of course, Bowie, um, to the Mexican uh, officers. While he's doing this, Santa Ana himself actually enters the complex. And you can imagine this moment, like it's pre dawn, it's, it's the dark, the darkness has just left, the sun is coming up, but there's black powder smoke everywhere. It's a really chaotic scene as people dying on the ground, screaming and moaning. And then the president of Mexico, the general of the army comes walking up to Joe. And Joe later described him as, quote, looking like a Methodist preacher. That's how Joe described Santa Ana, which is one of my favorite descriptions of Santa Ana from the Texas Revolution period, right? But Joe doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He, Susanna, and the other non-combatant survivors are brought from the Alamo over here on the uh, east side of town. They're brought into town and, you know, put all into the Muskies house. We're not exactly sure if Joe was put into the Muskies house, uh, Ramon Muskies' home, like Susanna and uh, Juana and Gertudis and all the other survivors. He might have been, he might not have been, we're not sure. But we do know that while he's there, you know, he, like Susanna, sees the funeral pyres at the Alamo as they're burning the bodies of the, of the dead defenders of the Alamo itself. And like Susanna and Juana, um, he also is interviewed by Santa Ana. And Joe, Joe's in town for like a day or so, um, unsure about what's going to happen to him. He has no idea. Again, the amount of precarious fear he must be feeling right now about Am I going to get killed? Am I going to be enslaved by these guys? What, what's going to happen to me? He has no control over any of that. Um, he did see a military review where, you know, Santa Ana soldiers marched in front of him. Um, and he estimated there was anywhere between six and 8,000 of those, of those soldiers. But what Joe does is at some point he leaves and uh, he might have run away from the Mexican army. He might have been just turned loose. We're not sure, but he, he definitely is in fear of being captured. So he takes off east on the Gonzales Road, back toward the colonies, by the way. He doesn't go south into Mexico. He doesn't stay in San Antonio. He heads back east, probably because that's where his family was. Um, and San Ana's army terrified him. So he went east from there, and he's heading out on the road towards Gonzales. Um, he doesn't leave with Susanna Dickinson. You know, he leaves before Susanna. So he's, he's out here going east toward Gonzales. And it's about five miles out of town, that's when Susanna comes across him. And so Susanna recognizes Joe, Joe recognizes Susanna, and they, you know, travel together the rest of the way to Gonzales, right? It's in Gonzales that they bring word to Sam Houston. And so, again, we always talk about Susanna as the person who brings word of the fall of the Alamo, and she does. She has the official uh, message that Santa Ana has sent with her to Sam Houston. But Joe's there too. And Joe gives his own account of what happened and what he saw in the, in the battle uh, in Gonzales. So Houston hears from both of them. And Houston then, as we've talked about, burns Gonzales, burns Susanna's home when he does so, and starts retreating east and this begins the runaway scrape. So all the horrors of the runaway scrape that we've been talking about in the retreating Texas army, Susanna experiences, but so does Joe. And Susanna doesn't have anything. Her husband's been killed. She has her daughter, Angelina, and that's it. But Joe has even less. Joe has no sense that he's going to be free, no idea exactly what's going to happen when he goes east, and has no idea, you know, if he goes east, he gets enslaved. If he goes west, maybe he gets killed. He's between, you know, the true rock and a hard place in all of these situations. When Santa Ana, sorry, when Sam Houston's army gets to the Brazos River, they go to the plantation of Jared Gross. We talked about it just earlier, right? And they rest there and train there, and the Texas government um, shows up there after declaring independence and all of that. And it's at Gross's plantation that Joe gets interviewed by the Texas government about what happened at the Alamo. And so we have um, a kind of synopsis of the account that he gave because there was a gentleman there from Virginia and William Fairfax Gray, who wrote down in his diary 
uh, an account of Joe's, an account of Joe's account, right? So this is, this is the closest we have to Joe's firsthand uh, account of what happened at the Alamo. Um, you can read it right here. The servant of the late lamented Travis, Joe, a black boy of about 21 or 22 years of age is now here, here being Gross's plantation. He was in the Alamo when the fatal attack was made. He is the only male of all who were in the fort who escaped death. And he, according to his own account, escaped narrowly. I heard him interrogated in the presence of the cabinet and others. And he related the affair with much modesty, apparent candor, and remarkably distinctly. And if you go on from there, you kind of get Joe's account. Um, it's what I've been kind of laying out here about what happened to him in the, in the Alamo itself. And you see the citation right there. It's a really great source to be able to and get that information and bring it into your classroom. Right? From there, Joe is Joe is turned back into property. He is turned over to the estate of William Barrett Travis. As we have mentioned earlier, Travis's son Charles is still alive, and will be the inheritor of everything in the estate, which included that Travis left behind, which included Joe. So Joe is turned over to a guy named John Jones, who is the administrator of the account, and will basically take care of. Um, William Barrett Travis's estate until Charles um, Travis comes of age. And so he's re-enslaved. He's rented out again to anyone who will pay for him and his services so he can make money for now his deceased master. And this goes on, you know, through the next, through the aftermath of the Texas Revolution, right? And what's really interesting is that Travis, we, we usually end the story with Joe there, but it's really interesting what happens after that. Joe stays in Texas for a little while longer. And then he runs away. And I've always found it just powerful to remember when he runs away. He runs away for freedom on April 21st, 1837, which is, as you guys know, exactly one year after the Battle of San Jacinto. He waits until the year anniversary of the Battle of San Jacinto and Texas independence and Texas freedom for him to claim his own freedom and his own independence. And he runs away from John Jones, who's the executor of the Travis estate. And so you guys can read the document here, obviously, um, but I just pulled out some of the details I work with on my students, right? He leaves on the night of April 21st, and the advertisement says, a Negro man named Joe, belonging to the succession of the late William Barrett Travis, who took with him a Mexican and two horses, bridles, saddles, and bridles. Joe ran away with a somebody, some ethnic Mexican. And sources seem to suggest that that Mexican who ran away was a POW from San Jacinto, one of Santa Ana's army who had been captured and kept as a POW was still in Texas. Joe would run away with a member of Santa Ana's former uh, army, I think is really telling and very interesting. Um, but they run away and we get, this is one of our best physical descriptions of, of Joe himself. He was about 25 years of age. That's what Jones was estimating. Five feet, 10 or 11 inches high, which was a little taller than the average man at the time. Average man at this time is about five, seven, maybe five, eight. So he's taller than normal. Very black and good countenance. Right? So he's a handsome gentleman. And this is the kicker. I always use this with my students, right? $40 to get Joe. And of course, the small bay horse. We need to get all the property back, right? Joe is, and the horse are both losses that need to come back and, and be brought back in, right? And Joe's not captured. Um, this runs uh, as an advertisement starting in May of 1837. And then a couple months later, it stops running. Um, what happens to Joe after that is very murky. And if you read the, the book that was written about Joe, there's a lot of speculation in there about what happened to him. We're not exactly sure. Um, reports are he went back to Alabama. Went back. He went to Alabama, which is where Travis's family was from. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. That remains a little unclear to me. Um, there's newspaper reports in Texas in the 1870s that he was back in Texas, uh, in Austin. And somebody named Joe was claiming to be that person from the Alamo after then. Again, we're not exactly sure, but we do know he did run away. And we do know he picked um, the anniversary of San Jacinto to do it. And one of the things that he's escaping when he escapes from San Jacinto and Texas is the expansion of slavery that happens under the Republic of Texas, which it expands dramatically and in ways that we'll talk about a little more on Friday when we make some more connections in this, right? 
The next story we're going to tell is about a free African-American woman in Texas named Emily West. And we're going to pause here before we talk about Emily. And I hand things back over to Jay to walk you guys through a few more resources, and then we'll pick up our story again. All right. Um, this Joe is probably one person that my students are constantly asking me about whatever happened to him, what, what's going on. And when we were initially talking about, you know, the voices, how we're gonna bring voice into Joe, one good book that I discovered and we put it in the chat and if Michelle, if you could find it, put it again is the Alamo Reader. When I got my Alamo Reader in, the first thing I went to is Joe. And there are several newspaper accounts uh, one of the accounts um, that I used in this document here is going to come from um, the same account that uh, Dr. Torgut was talking about. Um, there's several ones in the reader that you can definitely look through, but most importantly, there's also a commentary by the author. Uh, the author of this book is Todd Hansen. He does a really good job of kind of telling us as, as historians teaching Texas history that, um, yeah, don't buy this one. It's not accurate. Um, this one's a little bit more accurate. Um, and this is the reason why it's more accurate. So I kind of curated the story of Joe for you um, to use in your class. And before I start, the one thing that I am going to use and I have used is the $50 um, ad that Dr. Torgut just went over. I, that's one of the things I truly use in my classrooms where we are actually um, talking about this ad. It's one minute he's in the Alamo, the second minute he's he, now he's a runaway slave. Um, and we, we try to have class conversations with this. Um, this is going to be, when I conclude with the Alamo movie, because I have a ton of questions now, I, I use that movie because it helps me um, tie all the pieces together that we talk about in class, but then it also helps me. It also generates more questions as a teacher, which to me, I find questions from my kids outstanding because they're getting into it. Um, but this, this is one that I definitely use in my classroom. And I'm actually taking some information um, from Todd Hansen. And I like the comment that he makes in there that he's penniless and homeless. Joe sought um, employment in Washington on the Brazos. And this is all coming from the Alamo Reader. Um, and it's, to me, it was fascinating read um, and talks about what he does. Um, and then ultimately when he decides to run away, uh, John Jones puts this ad out. And, you know, I, I kind of asked the questions from my kids on this, do you think Joe actually stole the horses and the equipment? Um, and you know, I, and I also challenge my kids too. Before you respond, think for just a second: Did he really steal it? Um, remember, he was the, the the last known heir to Travis's estate. But does he have rights? So we have that conversation in class, and that generates a ton of conversation. Kids defending the position on it, um, and then I actually. This is new, that second question is a new one because I thought, like a lot of people, Travis was shot instantly and died. I don't know if this account's true or not. Um, I, I feel like it opens up the conversation for the kids to where um, he is shot, he rolls down, pops up. Um, and ultimately it, it kind of shows um, where we have Travis who is potentially wounded or seriously wounded, don't know. But this is Joe's account in a um, with to to William um, F. Gray um, of what happened to Travis that he ultimately died by being struck. I don't know if that's true or not. It's it, I just feel like that's just a really good um, conversation piece for the for the kids on that piece of. But that comes directly from the Alamo Reader, um, and based upon what I'm seeing, it seems to be pretty legit. Now, the one thing I have discovered, we have this piece of it. There is an author in the reader. His name is David Drake, who writes Joe Alamo Hero uh, Negro History Bulletin for the uh, Afro-American Afro Life and History Association. And he basically comes in and defends Joe. And I like this, what he does by defending him. Um, to be fair, the horses and saddles and bridles are part of the uh, late Colonel Travis's estates. 
As the only Texas survivor of, of the estate, Joe could hardly be labeled a thief for using the horses, especially when he learns of, um, of the destination. Several weeks after he leaves, um, this is the story I really like, he arrives home, and again, this is kind of based upon this, this, this historian's research that he relies home in Alabama, um, and I like to have that conversation, excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the wonders of Zoom. That's my 16-year-old dog hacking. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, um, he travels 800 miles, supposedly, from Washington, the Brazos to Alabama. And this is, again, part of what we, the Alamo Reader gives us. Again, this is, I'm going off the Alamo Reader. I'm going off these historians. And this is a good conversation to have with the kids on, uh, do you think this is true? These are coming from newspapers. And that's always a good conversation to have with kids because it always splits the room in, in, in some division. Some people, yes, but others say, this is all we have. So we have to believe it. But then this also gives us an opportunity to really talk about bias. Um, is the information bias? Even, even the account uh, that Dr. Torgitz um, brought up in his presentation about Joe, um, those are conversations that allows our kids to see multiple perspectives of this. Um, and I think ultimately the reason why I threw this conclusion piece into, I, I want to give, I want to give Joe that benefit of the doubt that, you know what, um, he's just trying to, this deal with, um, being back in slavery again is not the best deal. He's, he's got, he's trying to leave. And the story goes in this, in this, in the reader that he actually stays in Alabama, you know, and, um, ultimately has grandchildren around him. But again, too, that we have no idea about that. I didn't add that piece to it, but, what do I use in the classroom? I'm definitely going to bring in the conclusion this year because I, I feel like it's going to create more conversations with my kids. And that's that's what I really, really focus on. This I do. I'm not changing this piece of it. Um, the background essay, I, I don't know yet. I There's a couple pieces in, my, in the back of my mind that I will, probably will do, um, especially, you know, some of the things about Joe, how he was how he was considered according to the 1835 diary of Colonel William F. Gray, um, in giving his account, uh, gives him a greater sense of. And you'll notice I've actually changed uh, candor, uh, modesty, and distinctive. I've tried to put it in seventh grade language so the kids have that. So, um, and I just want to have that particular quote kind of in front of my kids to, because we, they understand what slavery is, they understand the institution, but at the same time too, um, here we have uh, a white Anglo-American in front of other Anglos as well as Tejano leadership, um, it's kind of viewed differently. And that I really want to give the kids the ability to, you know, have that conversation and question why and, and or discuss why. Um, these Anglo-Americans and Tejanos who for so long have been promoting slavery, but yet I still feel like several of them were conflicted as we have we've already discovered on that piece of it. So that's kind of what I would do with this one. Um, some of this other stuff could be extra um, content that you could actually probably use to um, speak during when you're talking to your students. I, when I'm doing my, when they're feverishly writing their notes, taking their notes or typing their notes, however they want to do it, um, I know I have to kind of add to my story when I'm talking, much like Dr. Torgett does, um, just to keep talking about that content, keep discussing it. Um, at the same time, it's we understand the seventh graders who were sixth graders last year are learning to take notes. Um, at, what I try to do is, is add more story to it behind it. So um, that's just a tip that you might want to take some of this content, maybe add it to your presentation, your teacher notes. And then from that point, you're, as they're taking the notes, you're buying them more time and you're not, they're not being rushed. And we always hear that famous term, wait, I'm not done type of thing. So uh, that is the story of Joe uh, in, a, in a format. I hope this can be useful to you. Um, again, if you have any questions, let me know. Dr. Target. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Um, proper screen here with y'all. All right. So. Now, I want to tell you guys a story that also works really well in my classroom about Emily West. And this is always a big hook because, you know, my students have heard they think of Emily West, or she's sometimes called Emily Morgan. We 
because um, they think of her as the Yellow Rose of Texas. And everybody's heard that song right, at some point. This is where history collides with, um, collides with mythology in the state. But it, that gives us an opportunity, I think, to talk about who these people really were and what they really mean in history. And with the Yellow Rose, I'm gonna give you guys some information that'd be useful for your students because I'm sure they've heard the song and they might've heard the myth that's associated with, um, with Emily with that song. And you know, being able to bust that apart, I find is a great hook to telling them like, well, actually, let's talk about the real story. And the real story is far more interesting usually than, than the mythology. And so the thing about Emily is we actually do have a decent amount of information uh, about her in the Texas Revolution. And she's a different kind of story too, because it's about a free African-American woman. There were not many free African-Americans in Texas. There were very, very few, but there were some in Texas. And so her story, I think, provides us a window into this group of people who experienced this time period as well. Now, the image I've got here is not Emily West. We don't have a picture of Emily West, so I'm using a stand-in here because I find that's really helpful with my students to, to give them some kind of visual. Um, I always tell them this isn't the actual person, but this is you know somebody from the era as a kind of our, our symbol of Emily, because we want to give her as much of a voice as we possibly can. And a lot of people do give Emily a voice, whether it's accurate or not. So she's been represented in popular culture as the Yellow Rose of Texas, and as this, if you've seen the Texas Rising series, as the siren of uh, San Jacinto and all this sort of stuff that is, you know, hypersexualized her in a way that is a little strange. Um, but it gets to the Yellow Rose myth that is associated with um, with um, Emily Morgan, that, that that song was written about her and that that song is about um, her at San Jacinto and everything that goes with that, all right? So I'm going to give you the source of the Yellow Rose story, all right, and where that came from so you guys can have a sense of this. So there's a guy named William Bollert, which that's a great name too, by the way who visited Texas in the early 1840s during the Republic of Texas period. And he wrote a lot of stuff about Texas during the 1840s. He interviewed people all across Texas. Um, there's a great resource called William Bullard's oh. Texas, which is basically a transcription of his, um, his notes and his diary while he was in Texas. Um, and while he was in Texas, he, he interviewed a lot of folks with the Texas Revolution, and then he wrote notes about it later. And one of the notes he wrote, it was in 1850, he wrote this thing down. And that note was never published in his lifetime. What the note said is that, and here's the quote, the Battle of San Jacinto was probably lost to the Mexicans owing to the influence of a mulatta girl, Emily, belonging to Colonel Morgan, who was closeted in the tent with General Santana. At the time the cry was made, the enemy, they come, they come and detain Santana so long that order could not be restored readily again, right? Now, this wasn't published at the time. Nobody knew about it. It was just in, in Bullard's papers. And he got the story, he said, from an officer who was at San Jacinto, right? So this was apparently a, a story that was being passed around in Texas, you know, in the early Republic of Texas period, at the very least. And so, Historians discovered this when Bullard's papers were donated to the University of Chicago and they were put into the archives there. And we historians are always discovering new things because we're getting our hands on new materials. And so Bullard's papers were a real gold mine. Historians found this story and they weren't quite sure what to make of it. Um, the woman, Emily, was named, was, was assumed to be a slave because almost everybody who was in Texas was a slave. And it says here, belonging, most African-Americans who were in Texas at the time were slaves. And it says belonging to Colonel Morgan. And so she was also assumed not to have a last name. So she was often called Emily Morgan after Colonel Morgan. Um, her name was not Emily Morgan, it was Emily West, but we'll get to that. Um, and you know, this was kind of a footnote sort of a thing. Nobody really made a whole lot of it because there's no other no other sources that said that uh, she was involved with Santa Ana in any way at the Battle of San Jacinto. This is literally the only thing that has ever said anything about that that we're aware of. Right? And that probably would have just been a footnote, except there's a guy named Henderson Shuffler. I know none of you have heard, well, I'm assuming none of you have heard of Henderson Shuffler. 
But Mr. Shuffler here was an amateur historian in the 1950s and 1960s who was just really enthused about a good story. And he heard about this um, scrap of paper that William Buller wrote down and he was fascinated by it. And, and then he got it in his head and it all came up in his head that maybe Emily Morgan was the, the subject of the Yellow Rose song that had been popular by this point and was being sung and all that sort of stuff. And he jumped in his head because if she's mulatta, that means she was the yellow rose of Texas and that this is referring to all that. He had zero evidence to put that together. But you will find that that doesn't stop people from telling what seems to be a good story. And so he decided, he, he went to the Dallas Morning News and he found a columnist at the Dallas Morning News who he talked into writing a column just asserting that Emily Morgan, as they called her, was the Yellow Rose of Texas and that song had been written about her. Is that true? No. Is there any evidence of it? None. Um, so that is that is a giant, uh, big old, old fashioned myth that's been hanging out there in Texas for some time. But there's a fascinating story to Emily West because it turns out she was in Texas during this period. And we can prove that she was in fact at San Jacinto at the time of the battle. Um, so I'm gonna tell you her story because this is the true story, at least as far as we've been able to document it, of Emily West. And I, I think it again shines a, a bright new light, not just on Texas mythology, but on that small proportion of Texans who are African-Americans who were free during the Texas Revolution, right? So Emily was from the Northern United States. Um, she, so here on this map, we're gonna look, you know, look beyond the South for once. And we're gonna go up to um, Connecticut, this is where she lived, and New York. And by the 1830s, slavery had been outlawed in both Connecticut and New York. And so there is a sizable free black population in, in these places. Um, Emily apparently worked as a domestic servant and she would work for wages. And usually they would do this by setting wages for a year that you would work for a particular house or a particular business for a year at a certain wage, you would sign a contract for that. And that's how she made her living. And you know she lived in uh, areas around New York as well. So she, she had a lot of opportunities there and there was a decent sized free African-American um, community in places like New York and in places like New Haven, Connecticut, which is where she also spent a lot of time, right? There's a man named James Morgan who then goes to New York from Texas. Now, James Morgan, um, this is the guy, Colonel Morgan, who's been referred to earlier in the Bowler note. James Morgan was from North Carolina and he came to Texas in 1830. And so when he comes to Texas from North Carolina, he's doing what everybody else is doing, trying to make money, grow cotton, that sort of stuff. He brings 16 slaves with him from North Carolina and he sneaks them in with that that Decree 56 contract loophole thing that brought in Joe. And he brings them in and he starts to make a living and doing all that sort of stuff. And by 1835, he joins forces with a few other folks in Texas that's looking to bring in speculators from New York, to try to bring in New York money to develop Texas, right? So on the eve of the revolution, he's, he's going to New York City to try to raise money to develop Texas, to build a new town called New Washington that he wanted to establish and, and all that sort of stuff. So James Morgan in 1835, as the revolution's getting, you know, just about to get started, he travels here to New York City, all right, to raise money and hire people to do some stuff for him in, new, in, in Texas. And at some point, we're not sure when or how, but at some point, James Morgan ran into um, Emily West. And he offers to bring her to Texas to work for him for wages uh, in his, his new town of New Washington that he's setting up. And he made her an offer for quite a bit of money that Emily decided she was going to take him up on and come down to Texas. He would pay for her passage on a ship and he would send her back afterward. And so they signed a contract together, um, James Morgan and Emily West. And that contract today is in the special archives at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, we've we found this within the last um, 30 years, it came to light um, by a lawyer named Jeff Dunn who discovered this. And the way the contract is written, you can read it right here. It says, entered into by and between Emily West of New Haven. So this is how we know her name. Um, New Haven, Connecticut on the one part and James Morgan of Texas on the other part. 
West hereby binds herself that she will go out to Texas and there work for said Morgan at any kind of housework she and said Morgan, she, said Morgan, is qualified to do. So she's going to be a domestic servant for um, James Morgan is what she's saying. Until the end of 12 months. So she signs a one-year contract and then Morgan promises to pay her $100 for that year. Wages to be paid every three months if that's something that Emily requests. So this is a contract, but it's not a 99-year contract the way that Decree 56 was bringing in folks. It's for 12 months. It specifically says how much she's going to get paid. If you read more of the contract, which we don't have here, but you know he was going to pay her expenses and all these other things. It's a very different kind of contract. She's free to sign this and she's free to come down, which is what she does. And so this is what brings Emily down to Texas as the Texas Revolution is emerging because she signs this in New York City in October of 1835. That is the very beginning of fighting in the Texas Revolution. She doesn't know it. James Morgan doesn't know it yet. News hasn't reached New York by this point, but they sign this in New York City and then she gets on one of two ships that Morgan has for bringing things back and sails to Texas. This is really interesting to me. This is her signature. Um, James Morgan's the one on top and Emily West's, Emily D. West's signature is on bottom. She was literate. She was a literate African-American woman who could clearly read and write and was aware of the contract terms and had set them out. It's very likely that she's the one who suggested and maybe demanded that wages be paid every three months and that that was put into the contract. It's unlikely James Morgan would have just offered that for no apparent reason. She might have well asked for that uh, as part of the negotiation process. Um, at the very least, we know she was literate, which put her in a very special category of African-Americans at this time, because most African-Americans who were enslaved in the South, it was forbidden to teach them to read or write. And so Emily has, um, has had some education available to her uh, throughout her life at some point. She gets on the ship, she sails down, and what she doesn't know, of course, is that she's sailing into the teeth of the Texas Revolution. And she can't possibly know that until they come ashore uh, at the mouth of the Brazos River. And when they land, they land in um, December of 1835, all right? So the, the Battle of Gonzales has already happened. The consultation where they can't decide what they're fighting for has happened. And the battle for Behar in San Antonio has also been going on and is just ending essentially at the same moment they arrive. News has yet to get this far east, but they'll find out about it soon enough. And where they go is New Washington. You can see this map here has New Washington on the map. New Washington doesn't really survive uh, the, the, the Texas Revolution, but it's right here on the, the bay, um, the Galveston Bay right here. And it's very close to San Jacinto. You see right over here? So the distance between these two places is not terribly far. And she's put to work in New Washington for um, James Morgan as Morgan's trying to build New Washington with some laborers he brought back from New York. And as the revolution goes on around them, Everybody else escapes during the runaway scrape. Morgan, he leaves New Washington. He goes down to Galveston as a part of the Texas military. He commands something called Fort Travis down there. So Emily West is sort of just stuck here um, in New Washington and does not evacuate with the Texas uh, during the, the runaway scrape. And for that reason, um, she is there on April 16th, 1836, when Santa Ana's army marches into New Washington. All right, so you can see the dotted line right here in this map is Santa Ana's troops. He comes up to Harrisburg because he's chasing the Texas government and will swing down eventually over to San Jacinto. Coss's troops come up this direction as well. And there's a, a, a military detachment under the command of Juan Almonte, which I'm sure you guys have run into Almonte. Um, he also has a, a great set of memoirs from the 1830s that have been translated and published and are a really wonderful resource uh, for this period. But Almonte's troops come into New Washington and they capture the town and basically take over the buildings that, that James Morgan had been building. And in so doing, they capture Emily West. They take her as a prisoner. All right. So this is, again, this is what people during the runaway scrape were trying to avoid, was getting captured by the Mexican soldiers. And so Almonte captures Emily West. She's taken as a prisoner. The next day, Santa Ana himself shows up in New Washington and orders the town and all of its buildings burned. So uh, for Emily Morgan, you can imagine the experience here. She's left New York City, the most developed city in the United States with a big you know, community of all sorts, but particularly African-American free community. 
She's landed in Texas in a war she didn't even know about. And now here's the president of Mexico, dictator of Mexico, the general of the Mexican army who's burning everything in his path has just shown up right in front of her, right? Discombobulating on absolutely every level. And she's a prisoner and she's taken with Santa Ana's army as they make their way up to San Jacinto four days later. So she travels with Santa Ana's army. She ends up at San Jacinto and she is behind the Mexican lines on April 21st, 1836, when the Battle of San Jacinto happens, right? We know this for reasons I'll get to here in just a second, but she's there. We can prove that she's there. And so when the battle happens during that afternoon, you know, we, we haven't talked a lot about the Battle of San Jacinto, but it's an 18 minute battle and then it's several hours of slaughtering Mexicans who are running away from the Texas army. And we saw Delu Rose's account of what the battlefield looked like in the aftermath. Emily Morgan, I'm sorry, Emily West um, survives that somehow. Right? She's in the thick of all of this. She could have been killed at any moment. She could have been shot. She could have been stabbed. She could have been clubbed. The fact that she survives is remarkable all by itself. We don't know how exactly she survives, but it's somehow she does and gets to the Texan camp because she's not taken prisoner by the Texans. Um, somehow she manages to, to communicate to the Texas side during the fight that she's not, she's not on the Mexican side. And she, is, she, is, um, she gets to... She stays free. Joe is re-enslaved after the Alamo. But Emily here never gets enslaved after San Jacinto. And so she's able to prove her freedom this entire time. That's also something I think is very important. Um, perhaps James Morgan attested to it, could show the contract. Not exactly sure how she was able to prove it throughout, but she was um, seen and recognized as a free woman during and after the, the Battle of San Jacinto itself. And so she stays in Texas after the end of the Texas Revolution, right? Her contract went from October 1835 till October of 1836. Um, and so she's still in Texas after that for a little while. And we know this because she applies for a passport to leave Texas. And she does this um, in, in the summer of 1837. And so what happens is that when Texas becomes a republic, to leave, you need to get a passport to be able to travel from Texas' as own country to the United States, which is where her home was and her family and everyone she wanted to go back to. So this is the letter where she hires a lawyer named Isaac Moreland who um, Isaac Moreland was at San Jacinto. He was an artillery man at the Battle of San Jacinto and he apparently met Emily West there and became acquainted with her. And so she hired him to petition the Secretary of State of the Republic of Texas at the time to give him a, to give her a passport to leave. So this is one of our best um, documents about proving that she was at the Battle of San Jacinto. It says, the bearer of this letter, Emily D. West, which we saw that it's her signature on her contract with Morgan, right? Emily D. West. Has been since my first acquaintance with her in April of 36, a free woman, right? So she was able to prove this from the beginning. She immigrated to this country with Colonel James Morgan from the state of New York in September of 35. That's probably when they met. So that's probably why she told him September. They signed the contract in October, but September of 35. And is now anxious to return and wishes a passport to get out of Texas, please. This is really interesting. Her three papers were lost at San Jacinto, as I am informed and believe in April of 36. So during the battle, or maybe when she's brought there by San Ana's troops, or however, at some point in the melee and chaos of all that, she loses her free papers. But she's still able to prove she's free, and she remains so throughout this period. But she also, as we can see from this, tries to get out of Texas uh, as fast as she can. And one of the reasons for this, and this is something I wanted to wrap up with, and we'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow, is that after the Texas Revolution, right, Texas emerges as a, as a cotton nation dedicated to growing cotton. It's 95% of the Republic of Texas's export economy. And therefore, it is a nation that's deeply committed to preserving and expanding slavery in Texas, right? Um, oops. And, and we know this because they said it in the Constitution of the Republic of Texas. 
And we'll break this apart a little bit tomorrow, but one of the things that the Constitution of the Republic of Texas does is it puts iron walls around protecting slavery in Texas. And one of the things that they say in doing that is that it is illegal for African-Americans to be free in Texas. You, if you're a free African-American, you have to leave Texas and not come back unless you get an act of Congress to stay. And so Emily really couldn't stay in Texas, even if she had wanted to. And so she has to leave. And so she replies for that passport. What happens after that? We don't know. We don't have any records if she got the passport or if she left, but presumably she did. We have no other reports, at least so far, the records may come out um, of what happens from her, of her from there. I'm gonna pause there and hand it back over to Jay, who's gonna walk you guys through a few more documents and then we're gonna have our usual discussion in our breakout rooms. All right, all right, here's, I took Emily West and I'll be honest with you, I haven't really used her. Everybody, like Dr. Torgo was talking about, everybody talks about Yellow Rose of Texas and I, yeah, I just, I've, I've never tried to spin that into it. Um, but doing the research on Emily West for you guys, um, I wanted to give you that background essay, a lot of what Dr. Torgett talked about. Um, I pulled from Texas State Historical Association on this one. Um, I do, I discovered that there was a new place called New Washington where um, Emily West and a lot of the other folks um, that Morgan was bringing down with him. And I kind of give a little bit of background on kind of what he was doing, what was going on, et cetera, um, and why he was coming out, coming to Texas. But this, this location, New Washington, is in you know, Harris County as today off of Galveston Bay, off of Buffalo Bayou and San Jacinto Bay. Um, and it was kind of fascinating to kind of see that piece of it. So again, that could be added to your, um, you know, your presentation about the Battle of San Jacinto and or um, I like the idea of this free um, African-American coming down on under contract concept. Um, I, I haven't introduced that, I haven't spun that into my lessons, um, but I think I may this year just because I wanna show some different lights with some or different aspects of things. Uh, but Can I- jump in real fast, Jay? I just, wanna, I just wanna build on what you're saying, which is to say, for me, the way I use her in my classes is that she's the exception that helps us understand the rule because she's brought down as a free person. That's by far the exception in Texas. She's a rarity in that sense. But what's the rule here is that she can't stay because slavery becomes such the rule in the Republic that to stay is a risk to herself. And it's a real kind of open opportunity there to give the conversation with students, I think, about what that means. Anyway, turn it back over. I just had an idea. No, that's, that's actually where I was, I was going to take it to, um, you know, here in a moment. Here's the, the contracted labor agreement um, and just some basic ideas, um, questions, um, asking, you know, do you think she did this freely? Why? Because that's a good question. Um, I feel like I'm going to use this one. I'm, I'm probably going to try to find a way to, to spin this into my classroom, maybe as an exit ticket more than anything else um, after the Battle of San Jacinto, um, give a little bit of background information about her, a um, little bit about why she's here, why she show up, what's going on. Um, and then I'm, I'm guesstimating, I could probably do this in about uh, 10, maybe 15 minutes uh, of an exit ticket um, and literally have them um, have a printed copy of this to where I'm handing out document A and a reduced version of the background essay. Um, not quite as much, maybe delete the new Washington piece of it. I'm, I'm going to definitely add that into, um, as I'm setting the story up, um, explaining why, why she and these people came down uh, to the students. Uh, but I'm, I want to use this, this contracted labor agreement because I want to I want to spin her in because I, I this is a voice I feel like um, needs to be added to the conversation that there were people um, who did this you know they would work manual labor labor or and or in, as um, house um, labor to make money and um, I'm hoping this generates the conversations to the point of then why do we need slavery why does Texas need slavery. Um, and I want to have that conversation because I know the students, they dislike the institution of slavery. Um, they, they, and I want them to see that there's something else out there um, from that point of view. And then the last document, uh, document A, what happened? I, I agree with Dr. Torgett. Um, this comes straight from Texas State Historical Association. Um, this just really talks about what, he's, what he just told you that um, the papers were destroyed. Um, if you read the, the link, go to the link that I have in there. 
Um, they talk about that Santa Ana supposedly destroyed um, Morgan's papers. Um, his, somehow his troops got a hold of that and they destroyed her, her, her contract. Um, so she definitely had to um, ski it out on out, get out of there. Um, the widow uh, Lorenzo de Zavala um, evidently pays for passage according to Texas State Historical Association. Uh, but I, the questions I really want to have my kids is why would she need free papers? You know, I have that conversation somewhere in my um, presentation. I need to modify my presentation um, about her as I talk about her is that going back to the conversation of if you're African-American, you're going to be enslaved in Texas. You know, why, why would she be worried about this? Do you think she might have a fear about this? And as Dr. Torbett mentioned, yeah, she wants to get out of here. So it's, I'm, I'm not going to be part of the system called slavery. So this is a really, I purposely want to make this short and sweet. I could have gone deeper into this, adding more information and um, to the point where it would convolute what we're really trying to do. But I wanted to bring Emily West short and sweet into my classroom. I'm thinking 10 to 15 minutes uh, max um, as a exit ticket. Um, not so much as a full document-based question, but more about stimulating conversations. Um, and, and by all means, I know I saw a comment, hey, more is better. I get more is better. But to me, I want to be able to glean out 10 to 15 minutes of an activity. And then we're going to be wrapping up this whole little case of, and the other thing too, you could also take this piece that even Dr. Torgut talks about is leverage. Um, why she wants to get out of there? Because now we're talking, moving into the Republic. And this could open up the conversation about the Constitution um, that, as Dr. Torgut mentions, bring that, weave that piece on the back end of it. So that, so if, the, if it's Tuesday and you're ready to go on Thursday for after your, te your test, all right, you're, you've already segue and you can actually come back to Emily West and reference her, but you're talking about the, how slavery was written into the Texas Constitution. So those are some ideas, um, but again, Emily West is new for me, but I, I pretty much already, when I was writing this, I knew exactly where I was going to put her in my presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed um, the African-American voices, um, and I hope that you can get something out of this.